name's Jen Flory. I'm the director of the Cancer Legal Resource Center. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about it in the presentation, but we're based right now out of Los Angeles. Um, so that's why you'll notice some of our phone numbers start with the 213. But even if you don't get anything else out of this presentation, the two most important things would be our hotline phone number. It's 866-CLRC because we do take calls from individuals and we'll point you in the right direction. And then the second thing is the cancerlegalresourcecenter.org, our website, um, because we have all sorts of materials, manuals, all sorts of things like that available free online. So if any of these topics, you know, they kind of, you hear about it now and a year or two down the road you think, oh, I remember something about that, I need to know. Either look on our website or give us a call and we'll help you out. Okay, so the Cancer Legal Resource Center, our mission is basically, we're an education-based legal services provider, and so we want to provide information and resources on cancer-related issues to cancer patients, survivors, and all the people that work with them, like their caregivers. Um, we also do quite a lot of outreach to health professionals because most people, when there's a cancer diagnosis in the family, the health professionals are who they're interacting with the most. Um, they're not thinking to call a lawyer. <laughs> Probably a good thing. <laughs> And then we're a joint project of two organizations. One is Loyola Law School in Los Angeles, where I also teach a class on this. And the other one is the Disability Rights Legal Center, which is basically the organization that we're kind of one of their projects. <laughs> OK, so we do do conferences around the country. We had one in Boston in June. The next one's coming up are Chicago, um, Central California, and then Houston, Texas. So if you just can't get enough and you want all day cancer law, you're welcome to join us. <laughs> And then, like I said, our online resources, um, they're available for you. And then our hotline, so the way that that works is you call us up, um, usually it's a message that's left, and you can do it either through the phone or we have an online intake form if you'd prefer to just kind of type out everything that's going on. Um, you can send us an email, a letter, or a fax. I don't know who sends faxes anymore except the government, but you can. Um, so, you know, and then what we do is we talk to you for a little bit, try and figure out what's going on because we covered the entire United States. We'd need to do a little bit of research in your jurisdiction, figure out what the best resources are for you. And then we don't actually represent anybody. Um, that would mean that we'd have to be licensed in all 50 states, <laughs> which is daunting enough in one. And, but we can point you, here's the relevant law in your state, and here are some of the resources that you can call where they can help you out with. A lot of times it's just a government agency that you need to talk to. Um, if there is something where we think there's something really egregious that's gone wrong and you're probably going to need to get involved in some litigation, we can give you references. Um, we do have a professional panel of uh, several hundred uh, lawyers and other professionals, or we can just refer you to the local bar association <coughs> in your area. Okay, so what are cancer-related legal issues? They can be almost anything. The most common ones we see are around health insurance. We also see quite a lot from people around employment and taking time off work. Uh, quite a bit around disability insurance, but then all of these other issues come into play, whether it's advanced medical directives, whether it's um, family law issues. So all of these come into play. And of course, uh, consumer law, because a lot of times when there's a cancer diagnosis, there's suddenly a lot of bills besides the health bills that aren't always getting paid on time. Okay, so the first, I'm just going to touch really briefly on education rights because there's actually a whole seminar after this about dealing with some of the education things. But just to kind of issue spot for you guys, I want you to know, first of all, that most of the law that I'm going to talk about is going to be federal law because federal law is going to be the basic minimum that you have in every state. Um, I'll give you some examples of the states around here if there's changes, but the changes unless it's an older law that's irrelevant now, the changes are all gonna be enhancements to the federal law. Um, so here, for education rights, for example, um, under the Americans with Disabilities Act and the Rehab Act, um, this means that every child has, should have meaningful access to educational programs, services, and activities. Um, meaningful means something that they can actually use. So if your child is sick and can't attend class and they say, sorry, your child isn't in class, they don't get to have education, that's not really meaningful access. Um, so meaningful access can, um, it just basically means that they're in an environment where they can learn. Um, reasonable accommodation is the other half of that, and that means if they can't attend you know, a traditional classroom setting or they can't do it just like every other kid does, where they're only allowed to miss one or two days, um, the school, if it's a state-funded school, needs to make a reasonable accommodation. So that means if your child needs a note taker, 
if your child needs you know to be allowed to take time out more than the school would normally allow to go to appointments these things are all okay so now because this is federal law it's really only c controlling government schools so that would be all of the public schools but most states also require that state schools or private schools don't discriminate and so then it just gets a little gray in what's discrimination and what's a private school doing what a private school is allowed to do. So, um, so just the key thing there is that you know you, you do have the opportunity to ask for a reasonable accommodation. The other part of the education rights that are important to know, um, this came out of an act called IDEA, which is the Individuals with Disabilities in Education Act, and it was basically for children with learning disabilities, but it can be broadly applied to other areas of the law as well, and that would be that they have to provide early intervention, meaning they have to test and make sure that you know if your child's not doing well, that they don't just assume that they don't want to do well, that they try to figure out why they're not doing well. Um, they need to offer special education, and special education needs to be offered in a manner that's the least restrictive environment possible. That means we're not gonna necessarily put these kids in a separate class, in a separate campus, and isolate them from everybody else if that's not what's appropriate. So, and then it also, some related services, like if they need some extra services um, that are going to make that education actually work. The big thing that most people um, think about when they think about special education plans is what's called individualized education programs. And they're often referred to as IEPs, so if you're ever talking to somebody who works in legal services around special education uh, issues, they might want to ask you, do you have an IEP with your school? And what that is, is that's a process where you request that the school assess your child, and then it's a back and forth process where they have to assess your child, you meet with them, and everybody is supposed to, in theory, come together around a plan that's gonna work for the kid. <laughs> I see you shaking your head. I say in theory, there are, is a reason there are special education attorneys. <laughs> um, because many schools do not like to do what they require to do because, you know, schools have tough time with funding. Um, so if you're asking for something special, they'll say we don't have the money for it, but you need to then go back and say, you know, if you're in a, pu federal, in a public school, these are my federal rights. Um, and like somebody just mentioned to me before, somebody heard a presentation on this a few years ago, went to their school and they said, oh, you want a presentation in Pennsylvania? That doesn't apply here in New Jersey. This is federal law, it applies. Mm -hmm. um, so it applies all over the country. Um, like I said before, there's another presentation that's gonna be more on how you kind of negotiate some of these things and work with the school. Um, I would encourage you to go, if it doesn't work out to work with the school, know that there are special education attorneys our office, besides having the Cancer Legal Resource uh, Program, we also have an entire special education program, so you can call us for that too. Okay, now I was asked, you know, that I give information not just on things that are obvious to children, but a lot of people with children um, who have chronic illnesses are worried, what's gonna happen when they go to work? So this is just to give you some assurances. Um, after the basic of it, some of it might also be things that would apply to you guys as well as caretakers of children. Um, so just to get to the basics on um, employment discrimination in general. Now when we're talking about disabilities, a lot of you might be thinking, my child has cancer, not a disability. Um, under the American with Disabilities Act, that for a while that was slightly the case. Um, we wrote the act in the 90s and thought that, you know, this would protect everybody regardless of their need. There was some bad case law for a while, but it was amended uh, a few years ago. And so now it specifically includes cancer when cancer is something that requires that you have a reasonable accommodation. So the ADA and then most states have um, state laws that basically either mirror the ADA or they say, you know, the ADA might only apply to these people, but we're going to add these people in. So it basically means that in a place of employment, there's not allowed to be any discrimination against somebody with a disability. Um, so the reason, and so this is protecting at all phases of employment. And the reason that I bring this up is because most of your children will soon be employed. Well, maybe not soon, depends how young they are. But also a lot of times people wonder about things like, oh, is it bad if you know, we had a blog up or we had one of those websites where people can you know, organize so that they can pray and things like that, and you know, people might know that my child has had a sickness. 
um, you know, because some of this information is public information, and so then maybe later when an employer is going to screen, they'll find out, oh no, this person had cancer, we don't want to hire them. That's unlawful discrimination. Uh, what's important is whether somebody has the qualifications for the job and whether they can do the job with any sort of reasonable accommodation. So the, who does the ADA apply to? It applies to employers with 15 or more employees. Um, most, like I said, most of the state laws were added on to kind of change that a little. For example, here in Pennsylvania, the state law says basically the same protections of the ADA are going to apply to employers with more than four people. Um, in New Jersey, they say any employer with more than one employee. Um, and then there are states that don't really add on to it at all, so 15 is your minimum. Um, and then it, it applies to some employees, but here it's, you know, you're looking at if somebody has a disability that's recognized by the ADA, and almost anything can be recognized by the ADA, and if the person's qualified. So if the person can, and the way that in the red there is the technical definition, if they can perform the essential function of the job with or without accommodation. So if they have the degree that's required for the job, if they have the training that's required for the job, and they have those skills that that job needs, they're qualified. It's not, do I like this person more? Do I think they'll you know, look good for the company? So are they qualified? So the first thing is the definition. Um, and so that can be any sort of physical or mental impairment. That's why cancer often falls into this. Um, obviously, if there is no absolute trace of cancer left, it might be a little bit of a stretch. But the other thing that it applies to is perceived disabilities. Um, this has come out of a lot of litigation where, you know, somebody may or may not have even had the disability, but when people think you have it and that's the reason they're discriminated against you, that's illegal as well. So, um, so if you have any sort of physical or mental impairment that substantially limits a major life activity, so that would be anything, whether it be walking, sitting, breathing, any sort of life activity that you need to get through your life, if there's some sort of impairment to it, enough that you need to do something a little different in your life, you're going to qualify as disabled under this law. Now there's other areas of the law where the definition of disability is a lot different than this. This is for discrimination. The other thing is the reasonable accommodation. So if you are qualified, you have a disability, the employer is required to see if a reasonable accommodation is possible. And that means they can modify your physical work environment. That means they can modify the hours that you work. Um, they can restructure your job. Um, some of the things that people often do are a shortened work day or they work from home. Um, leave for doctor visits. So these are all things that an employer is required to do as long as it means that you can still do the basic functions of your job. Now obviously if you can't come into your job at all and your job is working directly with the public, then that's not a reasonable accommodation. <laughs> so, um, so it has to be something that's not really going to affect the way that the business is run, but it's going to enable somebody to do a job. So there's some resources here. Um, the EEOC is the major one, and the reason that I would point you to that one is because, first of all, that's the federal government agency that's responsible. It's the Equal Opportunity um, Employment Commission, and um, they also they have quite a lot of guides on there that um, have been helpful to people when they're trying to negotiate something with their employer. Because sometimes this will be the first that an employer has ever heard that they can't discriminate. Um, or sometimes they might think that you know, something that's a little less obvious than, say, blindness or deafness, they don't quite know how to deal with it. Like some people, what is disabling to them is things like fatigue or things that are a little trickier in the employer's eyes on how to deal with. And they actually have some fairly good guidances that will help out um, you know, describe what are reasonable accommodations, what are not reasonable accommodations. So if it's you going in and saying, you know, this is what the government says too, can we work, you know, with something like this, rather than just saying, hey, I'd like to be able to take an hour off in the middle of the day, it's often a better negotiating tool. And if they don't do it, that's who you ultimately complain to. Um, I want to point you down to the one down here, the Job Accommodation Network. Um, I guess that doesn't point at all, <laughs> not on the overhead. Uh, the Ask Jan, that's um, if you are trying to negotiate with an employer reasonable accommodation, that is, um, you can actually call them up and they will assist your employer in figuring out how to do the reasonable accommodation. 
Um, we left a California reference in there that's probably not relevant to most of you. The other one is you can always call us at the 866, the CRLC, and we can help you out to figure out if it's something that is reasonable. Now the next area is something that is not just pertinent to your children when they grow up and start working, but it's also pertinent to you now. So this is how much time can you take off work if you need to take care of somebody. Um, so this is the Family and Medical Leave Act. It's a recent change in federal law a few years back. And it basically says that people who are severely sick and can't work, in other words, a reasonable accommodation is not going to do it, um, or you're taking care of a covered family member, then you are entitled to 12 weeks um, per year to take off. Now, the 12 weeks um, is unpaid, so that's the not good part about it, but it does protect your job and it protects your health insurance status. So those are the key issues that are important to most people. So yourself, obviously, if you are very sick and need to take the time off, and then covered family members. This is one area where federal and state law changes. So this is the minimum. Um, it's parents, minor children, and spouses. So for example, in New Jersey, they include in-laws as parents and step-parents as parents. Um, in California, parents, as parents. parents are also your parents. No, not your biological parents. They don't count. <laughs> they don't count. In California, we're trying to get through some legislation right now that would hugely expand it to siblings, grandparents, grandchildren, and just kind of get the extended family in there. Um, but we'll see if that gets passed. It has a couple more months. Um, so, and then I think, like here in Pennsylvania, there's no additional uh, people added to that, and similarly in Delaware. Um, but that, again, if you want to know state by state, call us up, look on our website, we'll have it there for you. Okay, so like we said before, it can be taken intermittently, it can be taken all at once. So, um, and then they have a couple different ways to calculate once your 12 weeks is up. They can actually calculate either in, actually it's three ways, either in a calendar year, so you would have, if you use 12 weeks, you would have to wait, well let's say you use 12 weeks from January to March. Some employers will just say, well next January you can do it again. Some will say that you can't do it again until uh, 12 months after your last leave, and that is permissible, so unfortunately some, you know, it might be at least a year once you've, ex once you've used all of it that you can take it again. Some are a little more generous, um, and it doesn't say that they can't be more generous. So, and then the covered employer, this is the trick for a lot, and it's this bottom part here, large private employers. So they have to have 50 employees in a 75 mile radius. Um, and this is another area, for example, in New Jersey, they just decided to change it to 50 anywhere. It doesn't matter if they're in New Jersey or not. And that's another area where a lot of states had added on. But they are a little reluctant to add on in that area because a lot of states are viewing it as a burden to the employer if it's a small employer. Now, who gets it on the employee side? This is the other trick. If you just started a new job, you might not be protected. Um, like I said, this is the federal minimum though. A lot of times in your employee handbook or your employer policies, there's something that might be a little more generous than this, but usually you have to have worked there for 12 months in order to be able to take these 12 weeks off. And then you also have to have worked uh, 1,250 hours. That works out to roughly 25 hours a week. So you have to be at least a little bit more than part-time. Oh, that's still part-time, but not like very minimal part-time. So, um, because the idea was to give it to full-time employees, but then they started saying, well, what if it's someone working 30 hours? So they just came up with this number, and it works up to about 25, so. Okay, so that was on the leave. Now, what if you decide that you would need a little money when you're getting the leave? So there's three types of disability insurance programs. The private insurance ones usually come with your employer because if you have any sort of pre-existing condition, they can be a little tricky to get um, on your own. So, um, but you can get them, they're just expensive. Some states have short-term insurance. The only one around here is New Jersey. Um, I think there's only five states, California and Hawaii are two of them, and then there's, did I write it down? Rhode Island and New York would be the other two. So they have a short-term disability, that's what you're talking about where they're paying out. Um, 
And then there's also federal long-term insurance. So this would be, you know, here you have to have a disability and suddenly the definitions of disability change. On private insurance, it's just defined by the insurance policy itself, whether you got it or your employer bought it. Um, and a lot of times people use that with their family medical leave and that's how they're drawing money. Usually only covers about 60 to 70% of your salary. State short-term insurance, like in California, we get a chunk of money taken out of our paycheck no matter what, whether we want it or not. And so then we have a short-term disability pool. Now, in all the states that don't have it, it is usually an option that you can sign up for, but most people don't. Um, so just because they don't want more taken out of their paycheck. But it is something, you know, as your kids grow older, because they do have a pre-existing condition that might make it harder to get disability insurance on their own, you know, most kids, first thing out of high school or college, they just want to take a paycheck. They're not looking at the benefits, but the disability benefits do matter. Uh, the last one is federal long-term insurance, and these are known as SSDI and SSI, and they tend to incite fear in some offices because they can be really difficult with their definitions. Um, so federal long-term disability insurance, in this case when they're using disability, they mean something completely different than in the discriminatory context. They mean basically that you cannot work and that your disability is so severe that it's gonna last at least a year or you're going to die from it. So the unfortunate thing is they have this very, very strict definition of disability that implies that you are not able to work at all, but it takes almost a year for them to decide these applications. <laughs> so it's kind of the really cruel iron or irony of it. If you look on their website, they say they average uh, three to four months to make a determination, but that's the average. So they're averaging, even in the ones that are just rubber stamped immediately because of the condition, they're averaging those with the ones that take a year, a year and a half. And then most people with kind of gray area conditions usually get a denial, then they file an appeal, and then they go to a hearing. Um, the other thing about these, the main difference between the two is SSDI is for people who have a work history. SSI is for people who don't have a work history. So if somebody's never been able to work because of their condition, it's probably SSI that they're going to ask for. If they worked and then, you know, had some sort of remission or got a secondary cancer or something like that happened, then they're going to apply for SSDI. And the reason is because SSDI is based on past earnings, so it pays out a little more. SSI, the federal government pays out $698 a month, which most people can't live off of. <laughs> um, a couple states add on a bit more money, but I don't think there's many of them left that do. Um, now, it's generally thought of for people over 18 because they would be on their own, but anybody can apply for it. It's just if you're under 18, they take the parent's income into account. So it's really only going to be helpful if the parents have lost their job or some other horrible thing has happened. Um, but if that's the case, then by all means, apply for the SSI. Now, um, with SSI, when you apply, even though it might take them a year, year and a half, the moment that they're grant, grant it to you, they have to give it all the way back to the date that you applied. With SSDI, they don't have to go quite as far back, but they still do have to give you back pay, so it is worth applying even if you don't think you'll get the money immediately when you need it. Um, and the, that's also, if you do end up in a situation where you need to file an appeal, um, there are attorneys that do this because what they do is rather than make you pay, they usually take a little chunk of your back pay. So that's usually how those arrangements work out. But the definition that they're using in Medicaid for disability is pretty much, it's the same as SSI for the most parts. Um, sometimes some states will give for a few other conditions, but it's a tough call. Now for kids, they'll cover um, you know, just if there's not enough money in the family. Um, but Medicaid is a little unique in that it's a federal program, but every state can set it up however they want. There's a couple baseline minimums right now that they have to do, but the things that they add on to it, some states decide, okay, certain cancer conditions, we're gonna add that on. Other states decide working parents, we're gonna add them on, you know, because they decide that, you know, it's no good for the family if one of the parents ends up in the hospital. Um, so there are differences there. Um, but in terms of disability for Medicaid, they're using that same definition. So now, all states do have a form of Medicaid. Some of them don't call it that, though. Um, in California, we call it Medi-Cal. In Wisconsin, I think they call it Badger Care. Um, <laughs> some of them have some really weird names for it. Um, but they do have some form of it. it just, they just might not have the same program that your child would fit into.
Now one thing, like I had mentioned before, um, it does take a very long time to process an application. Now if somebody has a very severe situation, you should definitely write this down, compassionate allowances, and um, I should stop pointing there because there's nothing. <laughs> compassionate allowances, and these are certain conditions that are an automatic approval for SSI or SSDI as long as your physician says that this is what it is. Now these are usually very severe forms of cancer that sound like they're going to be end of life. Um, but, or that they are just, you know, that somebody's so incapacitated that it's obvious that they're not going to be working. Um, there's a list on there. We used to try to print it on the slide, but it doesn't fit on the slide at all. Um, and it has a specific diagnosis that you have to have. And if your doctor certifies one of those diagnoses, they will speed up the application because there's no decision for the eligibility worker to make. Um, it's not like with other ones where they have to review a bunch of medical records, which is what slows the process down with those. It's like, yep, that's on the short list. Okay, health insurance. The, much like cancer treatment itself, health insurance has been changing a lot. And the next two years are going to be really bumpy because we're going through the implementation of the Affordable Care Act. Um, now, I don't, like, what you think politically of the Affordable Care Act is either here nor there. We're not even really going to talk much about the individual mandate, but there are a lot of consumer protections that you should know about in it. The first one is the pre-existing conditions for children that's already taken place. So if you have a policy, um, with the exception of a couple individual policies that were grandfathered that will expire by 2014, almost every other employer type of coverage or any other type of coverage that you have, children can no longer be excluded because they have a pre-existing condition. In a year and a half, nobody can be excluded for a pre-existing condition. Okay, now for another definition of children, the thing, uh, part of the Affordable Care Act that has already been implemented since 2010, um, they basically up the age of children to be on your policy. So your kids can remain on your policy as a dependent until they're 26, even if they get married, um, because they didn't want to preclude children or young people from getting married just because they wanted health insurance, which happens. Um, even if they're not living with you, or they went to school, or they're not financially dependent on you, or if they have a job. Now this last one, eligible to enroll in their employer's plans, there's a couple of plans that are still allowed to do this because they were in existence before 2010. Uh, they have to tell the consumers this is a grandfather plan, and that's only for people who are eligible to enroll in another form of health insurance though. Uh, but all the other reasons, um, your kids can stay on until they're 26. So you might be thinking what happens after they're 26, the way health insurance goes. We'll get to that in a second. One other change that's already taken place at the Affordable Care Act is lifetime limits. They are now gone, illegal, verboten. Annual limits is gradually phasing out until 2014. Um, there's a couple, like I said, of those grandfather plans. You won't know it by looking at it unless you ask specifically, is this a grandfather plan? But for, I would say on this one, for about 90% of the health plans in America currently, right now, 2 million is the minimum annual limit that they're allowed to give. By 2014, there'll be no more annual limit. And every, I think it's been every year they've gradually increased that limit, so it's going to go up again in 2013. All right, so the big question people ask, and this one will affect both your kids as they get older and yourselves. Um, COBRA is the type of insurance that happens when all of a sudden you can't get it from your employer anymore. And so basically, whether you were laid off or if your child turns 27 um, and is no longer eligible, there's kind of this area where basically you need to start picking up your whole premium which is expensive depending on the kind of insurance that you have, but you can still have insurance rather than going out onto the individual market and being denied. Um, so it depends on the reason. And then for federal COBRA, you have to pay 102% of the premium. So that 2% is an administrative fee. Um, and so the rest just means your employer is no longer responsible for you, but you're in the same policy that you've had before. Okay, so first of all for COBRA, the reason you would get a COBRA policy is because either your employment was terminated, um, or say you got it through your husband and your husband and you either got a divorce or died, or very common, the person who was the employee suddenly is eligible for Medicare. Um, it means that the other person has a little time there before they get 
cut off the plan. And then this common one, the child ages out, which is now the 26-year-old ages out, um, it gets another three years there. Okay, so eligibility for COBRA under federal law is if there are 20 or more employees. Now, most states have what they call a mini COBRA. And the amount of employees does change in every state, but that's to pick up um, for the smaller employers. Because the thing is, it doesn't cost the employer anything. You're paying the premium. Um, but there is a small administrative fee, so the state actually has to set up the program by which they monitor and see if the employers actually send you your COBRA forms. Um, so, like in Pennsylvania, you get nine months after if you work for a small employer. In New Jersey, it's, 20, or it's 18 to 36 months, just like regular COBRA. Delaware hasn't set anything up. And so we'll talk about what to do if you don't get that COBRA. Um, but most of the states seem to have some form of, it basically is the same rules as COBRA, only oddly in California, you only pay 100% instead of 102%. I don't know why certain people have administrative fees and certain people don't. So what happens when you've used up your COBRA or you're suddenly eligible for some other things and it's called COBRA exhaustion. To have exhausted COBRA means your employer is done, you've used up all your COBRA, you weren't eligible for COBRA because your employer was too small. Not exhausted means I didn't pay for COBRA, now I'm gonna go and try and get something else. You don't get quite the same rights if you didn't use up your COBRA. So the one that, one of the ones that you were talking about, um, HIPAA is actually a larger law that protects your medical <coughs> privacy rights, but there's also specific HIPAA insurance plans. So every state has guaranteed issue plans or they have a state pool. Um, and this is what you were talking about. If I, for example, go and apply in California, if I apply for Blue Cross, um, they're gonna look at my health history and they're gonna say, you know what, you have a pre-existing condition, we're not gonna give you anything. If I can say, well, I was insured until recently, can I have a conversion policy or can I have a HIPAA plan they'll have to give me a quote for something. A conversion policy is if your employer stops providing group insurance, you can convert it to individual insurance. They don't underwrite, but they're high premiums. A HIPAA plan is usually when you're not eligible for COBRA, but you recently had coverage, or you ran out of your COBRA, you get a HIPAA plan. And then um, there are some issues on that. You can't have a break in coverage, or you're not eligible for these plans. And I'll tell you, and then some of them can exclude some pre-existing conditions, but they have to count the time that you were covered. So if they have a 12-month exclusion period and you've had insurance for the last 10 years, they can't exclude anything. Um, so there's an, ex uh, oh, and then credible coverage means that you have to have had creditable insurance within, um, you can have a 63-day gap, but no more than that. Creditable coverage means almost any kind of health insurance coverage, except for the policies that are just catastrophic only policies because those ones don't cover most problems, they only cover if you get in an accident. So this was just an example to kind of run through. So if your plan that you applied for says, we have a six month pre-existing condition, but you had coverage for four months, they can only exclude your pre-existing condition for two months. They have to include all of your other problems that you might come up with, but just the one thing that they said was pre-existing. And then the other thing is, here in Pennsylvania, it's called PA Fair Care, or Pennsylvania Fair Care. Most places are calling them PCIPs. Um, and I actually should have put the PCIP website on. If you go to www.pcip.gov, um, that has, that's a federal site for all of the state pre-existing insurance plans. So if you've gone without insurance for six months, they will give you a quote. Here in Pennsylvania, it's actually some of the lowest premiums I've seen. They just say 283 across the board. Other states have it flexible, and it's usually between 100 to about $500, depending on your age. Um, and then there's also some states have a different uh, or an additional um, pool for high-risk people. But some of those states have waiting lists on their pools, and their insurance premiums are really similar to the HIPAA ones. They run about 1000 a month, if not more. So the last thing, besides back to the Medicaid expansion, the thing that is changing that a lot of, that was kind of the weird thing that came out of the recent Supreme Court decision, they were fighting about whether the federal government could mandate that the states expand Medicaid to anybody earning less than 133% of the federal poverty level. Now it's an option for the states. Most states are going to take it. 
um, if for nothing less than the hospitals are really pressuring them to take it because when they don't get paid, they get angry. <laughs> um, and so basically what that would mean, there is a huge gap in most states for people who were sick but not disabled under the definition of disability. And what would happen is a lot of people would go without care until they became disabled, which is actually, from a public policy and public health perspective, is kind of a nightmare. So they're saying that all states have to cover everybody, and that's about 15,000 for a single person, although for a family of four, it's only, um, it's still under 30,000 because it doesn't multiply for every person the way they calculate the federal poverty level. Um, but it will mean that unemployed people who don't have other options can get Medicaid. And another thing that a lot of states do is if you're eligible for Medicaid and you were eligible for health insurance but you can't pay for it, like you have one of these HIPAA programs, sometimes the state will decide to just pay your premium rather than pay for all your Medicaid. But that's state by state, and even in the states where they have it, like in Pennsylvania, they get to decide whether it's cost efficient for them to pay your premium or enroll you in Medicaid. And then the final thing to keep in mind is medical records. Um, because as you know, your children get older, 10, 20 years down the line, something might come up. And so you should be aware of how long they have to keep your medical records. It's anywhere from about five to 10 years in most states. And most states require that they keep them until the age of majority and then five or 10 years, whichever is longer. Now, they're not gonna get rid of your medical records if you're still a patient there, so I wouldn't worry about it in that sense. Um, but if you, you, know, you haven't had to deal with cancer in years, you may wanna stop by and get the medical records. Um, some states allow you to either copy them or ask for a copy. I can't imagine most medical providers wanting people hanging around in their offices though photocopying the records, they usually send them to you. Um, the provider is required to respond by laws in almost every state to respond within 30 days, but in some cases where it's actually been changed into microfilm or something like that, they're given a little extra time. And then they can charge up to a dollar per page in most states, but it depends on how many pages you're asking for. Most of them, like the first 10 pages are a dollar and then it goes down to a quarter depending on how much.